Wells and Bourbon. Uh, the last time we did this, we promised we weren't going to take a huge hiatus. I think we made it through about, I'm going to say three. I'm going to give us three episodes uh, before we took a break. And that's coming up on today's Friday, 12, 8, 23, <laughs> three years in February, uh, this coming February, if you're keeping track at home. Uh, that being said, gotcha. part of the reason, and I'll get into this, is within we a lot of things have changed and clinically pressed has now turned nonprofit. I always had this idea of turning and uh, having a clinically pressed co-op, which would be a little mini podcast network, but you kind of need more than two or three podcasts in it. So this is going to be number four. We're going to throw into the mix, which <laughs> is uh, part of the reason for getting it started up as well. And also for the fact that uh, we just haven't really done a good job of keeping up on any kind of regular basis. So we're going to use this as an excuse uh, so I think first, if we want to just go around and kind of say where everybody's at, what you're up to, then we'll do our whiskey slash drink rating. And then we've got a topic for the evening. So Andy, you go first. Uh, what am I supposed What's to say? What's new and happening? Um, well, three years ago, I guess it would have been the same spot, uh, still at University of Illinois, um, but officially a PhD candidate rather than a student. That's about the only mm-hmm. update I can give. <laughs> that's a good one um, and I one step closer um, hoping to finish up and move on to a postdoc somewhere TBD uh, coming here in June hopefully nice. um, but yeah not super much change just still trying to be productive still trying to work and contribute hey Jay. I work right down the hall from Joel. We're uh, <laughs> in sports medicine department, Mayo Clinic. Long time system. listener, first time participant. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> joining the joining the rotation. Uh, still trying to do whatever research we can over there in Mayo Clinic. Um, still do quite a bit with EWL and their athletes over on campus when we can, and then certainly added the the firefighters into the rotation. They've been a nice cohort to work with, and done some cool projects with them and hopefully just scratching the surface on other stuff with that department locally or others kind of across the region is the the next step yeah and kind of as aj alluded to i moved out of the collegiate setting uh now working in the sports medicine department supporting an orthopedic surgeon and then kind of make up my job on the other days as the day comes uh doing a lot of stuff with the firefighters which is a fun uh, they're a good group uh definitely wants you makes you want to be a firefighter when you kind of work with them as we've witnessed from several people that have helped us collect data all of a sudden there's an interest in the profession um yeah god if it's been no i guess if the last one was in 2021 we had our one kid we have our second one now who's 17 months old uh, three-year-old so that's keeping life busy but other than that things are good Always good to catch up. Yeah. Um, what we're drinking tonight, Andy. I think yeah. we rated it on glasses, and we pretty much always came up with the same <laughs> rating, but that's okay. Whiskey's good, um, and that's He's all good. that matters. I have, I'm have. i lucky enough to have a very generous friend who loves to, his love language is gift giving. He has provided me a beautiful bottle of Blanton's. Um, you can't go wrong. Very nice bottle. Maybe not as prestigious as people chase it down to be, but still a very good whiskey. Um, I've never tried it, and that's why the bottle's almost gone. <laughs> when you share it with all your friends, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's 4.6 glasses. 4.6? Smooth, sweet, and it's just... Beautiful whiskey. Well, AJ, you're not much of a whiskey guy, are you? Crown is probably the, <laughs> the Crown my go to. Yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm drinking Bent Paddle tonight out of the nice. booth. Um I was just gonna ask, what's the scale out of four point six uh out of five? Five. Five. Okay. Well, that's a really good rating, man. Um oh it's a great whiskey. Yeah, I I would I would rate these probably around a four. I really like them. They did brewery out of there. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's what I'm rocking tonight, Joel. So I got, and it's all my nicer whiskey seem to age because I choose to drink cheap stuff on the regular and then just hold on to other bottles and just like it's like a scarcity effect. But I also enjoy like then sharing it when people do come over. So this Coach A from UWL actually brought back for me. It is a Door County single malt whiskey. Um, I had that. It's very good, uh, very mellow. Uh, I enjoy it. There, I mean, this there's still a good amount left for several years uh, of me not being at UWL. So um, solid, I'd say in that four and a half range, right up there. Um, a good one, you know, I think 40-ish dollars a bottle, which I feel like if, for me, that's like my sweet spot of like a good whiskey. Anything that starts getting way above 50, I don't know that I can tell the difference you know, between a $35 bottle and a $40 bottle, unless it's something dramatic with how it's created or the profile. So yeah, it's a good one. Uh, I was going to bring out the four daughters, which now does whiskey um, along with all their wine and everything else. But there was very little of that left. So we're going to save that for another day. So I can get a little bit of a replenishment on that one. So Yes, and if we once we polish this off, we'll switch over to uh, the cheaper stuff, which is usually a handle of Jim Beam from Sam's Club because it's cheap. <laughs> Good old Sam's ultimately Club. Ultimately, not that bad. Been there for me, but ultimately mm-hmm. not that bad. I I don't mind it at all. I still go with uh, Doc Doc Smigel's recommendation and drink uh, Old Forester out of a plastic bottle. Nice. Yeah, they don't have it. I did try some Evan Williams, uh, which is also not, I mean, again, I, I'm not a connoisseur. And when you're just wanting a decent pour, but you don't want to have it cost you $8 well, a glass. Well, I don't recommend McAdams if you're looking for the cheap stuff. Uh, that, used to, that used to be our camping whiskey. You get like a 175 of it for 10 bucks and head up into the woods. <laughs> yeah, just never terrible. Never back out. I mean, you could probably grab the the kerosene for the grill, and it wouldn't taste any different than <laughs> the whiskey. Ugh. All right. Uh, so our topic um, we were going to talk about, which we'll have to come up with a creative title at some point. Uh, maybe just do you even lift, bro? Uh, Good but uh, some of it uh, was a paper we were talking about um, offline, and then. Uh, which is just kind of comparing a couple different types of training. We thought that might be kind of interesting just to kind of talk about what we've found out in our own workout careers and what works, what doesn't seem to work for us and how that can apply to other people. Uh, But then also the idea of quote unquote muscle confusion, uh, which always seems to pop up for every now and again, if correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like P90X was like, the thing that introduced muscle confusion that was like their big sales pitch um back when that was huge and on the infomercials everywhere so i don't know aj you want to kind of give some of the background on what you kind of were seeing with it and kind of what brought the idea of the topic up yeah so the the study that joel referenced was a training study i think it was 12 weeks uh in which they were looking to see how two different training training styles could influence kind of training adaptations over the course of that training program. And so they split up two groups. One did three days a week of kind of a full body split. And the other um, group just did two days a week. No, let's see how many days a week did they do? The other one did more of a bro split. So they're just hammering body parts. Um, I feel like it was four days. It was like two to four. And- yeah ultimately equated for sets and reps yep that's right so four days a week doing a bro split i think they were upper and lower body yep and then the other two days a week group just did a full body workout twice a week and then the important detail there as joel mentioned uh is they equated volume across the two different uh, training groups which if we look at you know some of the things that influence muscle growth in particular it's it's volume throughout the week so what this study kind of found that it doesn't really matter how you're getting your volume whether it's in two days or if you disperse it over four days 
as long as you're targeting similar body parts or muscle groups equally in terms of the, the dose or the volume that you're applying there, you should see similar adaptations over the 12 weeks. And that's kind of exactly what they found with that study. And the thing that I did a, a research review on it, and the thing that I liked about it is that you could literally just take that then and kind of adapt it to whatever your life schedule is, you know, for that particular point in the year or however you're kind of going about training. So if you only have two days a week to lift, it's fine as long as you get enough volume in, in those two days. Um, and then the other thing, too, is the, the time part. They didn't mention this in the paper, but I got to imagine that the full body workout that they did had to at least have been an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Like there are a lot of exercises. Um, and so you're going to be in the gym longer or wherever you're lifting, whereas the other, you know, training sessions, you could probably knock out in 30 minutes if you really wanted to. And so that's something that I've switched to recently in lifting is literally sometimes even like a 20 minute lift just a couple body parts but that's all i really have time for in the day whether it's in the morning or at night or whatever in between taking the kids around town um and i I just find myself being more compliant by doing it that way otherwise i would always do that i don't have an hour to get to the gym to shower afterwards like it's more or less two hours that you gotta find I just didn't have those big blocks of time anymore, whereas carving off little 20, 30, maybe a 40 minute, you know, workout slot was just easier to, to kind of consistently do for me. So that's, that's what I resonated with when I read that. It was just kind of nice to see that played out in the literature a bit. Yeah, I totally agree with you. That's something I've tried to figure out. Like we were talking today when we were coming up with the idea, like, nine to 10, 12 at the most like movements in a workout is basically all I get in before something's going on or a kid was waking up or, you know, it's the end of the day and I just don't want to do anything anymore. Uh, I even tried to mess around with that a little bit back when I was doing more of uh, the programming Andy had sent me as not knowing what the morning was going to be. Cause even if I started working out every morning at five, sometimes the kid doesn't wake up till seven. Sometimes the kid wakes up at 5.15. Um, and so, like, if I could at least get, like, the big movement in of the that day, you know, bench the squat or the deadlift, at least I was getting something done, and it was more of the compound. It's not like I just went down there and was able to get three sets of curls in and call her, call her a day. Um, but definitely trying to figure out, like, in my little home gym, what little try set I can do or, you know, just kind of try super set to – use as much equipment as I can, but still hit as many body parts without fatiguing out. Um, I'm, I meant to screw around with the one by 20 program um, and did like one and then rethought my life because I thought I was going to die after uh. several uh, um, things. So I need to re- revamp that and get a little less ambitious from the beginning, but it is one uh, that I'm thinking about trying again, just basic concept of you pick – I think you're supposed to try and get upwards of 15 exercises in is the goal, but you do one set, 20 reps, and even at lighter weight, you hit 13, 14, and things start to fatigue pretty hard. Uh, So it is not easy, especially on big movements, to get to 20, yet still use a weight that you think – you should be using i think they were recommending kind of about 60 percent potentially of your max and i tried doing it on squat and that sucked it it was not (laughs) not fun so we're gonna we're gonna retool that one a little bit maybe start with a little less ego and see what happens uh but i'd be curious how that one truly goes but Again, something, you know, when you talk total body, you can hit a lot of muscle groups when you just got to do 20 reps um, if you can keep going through it. So, yeah. Yeah, and I I know, like, some of that, again, comes down to the training goal specifically. Like, Andy, do you think that, like, matching volume and stuff like that is the same for the strength and power world is for just more of the bodybuilding style? Um, okay, sorry. I didn't realize my 
Mike was muted. Uh, ask that again one more time. So, like, you know, equating volume from one workout style to the, to the next is really the, the most important variable there. And, again, you can disperse that volume really however you want throughout the week for muscle growth. But in terms of, like, strength and power, would you say it's a similar type of situation or a little bit different? Um, so, I mean, it's probably a little bit different, um, especially in terms of, like, maximal strength and power. Um, when we get into that realm, a lot of times – it's kind of a practice issue, right? So like, um, sure you can get stronger by doing a lighter weight for a lot of repetitions, but, um, you don't quite get the same, probably neural adaptations. Like you don't get the same synchronicity, probably the same activation, but more importantly, you don't get exposed to that. Right. So if you take somebody who does say, sets of 20 every day on back squat and try to make them max out on back squat, they're probably not going to get to take that too well. And if all you do for the next week is just have them max out every day, you're going to see an increase because they get exposed to those heavier repetitions more. They get exposed to that specific activity. Um, but that's not to say that that really matters. Um, unless you're a competitive power lifter or certainly like gym goers, it's nice to have a systematic approach to um, assessing the effect effectiveness or efficacy of your training. So certainly um, you can kind of go about a training program where you max out, but at the end of the day, repetition axes are fine. Um, unless for some reason you really enjoy the one rms or like i said you're a power lifter and along those lines i think for muscular power it's got to be the same thing um because it, if you don't go about explosive or rapid contractions very often i, I just can't foresee you're going to have the same adaptation um but there are once one paper pops to mind um along that line it was who was it it was Digby Sale and David Bem, I think um and it's a really interesting finding that I don't think anyone has really followed up on until I mean they're kind of tiptoeing around it now um with the actual movement speed or velocity versus the intended um what they did is isometric type work um versus uh, isokinetic type work. Um, what they found after a period of training, I forget how long it was, I haven't read this paper for probably since TCU, so for four years maybe. Um, but what they found is even if you don't have the movement velocity um, in actual practice, so say you intend to do a very explosive leg extension, but it's against a dynamometer that's not going to move. If you intend to activate that way and do an explosive one, the adaptations match uh, exercise where you move in that way, where you have the free actual motion. Weird. Which kind of makes sense if you think about it. Um, like I said, I, I haven't seen any follow-ups on it, but why would it actually moving really matter? Whether you move or not, the muscular contraction, I guess I, I go back. Yeah, but something. you're not getting any of that stretch shortening cycle response that I would think would be needed there. Yeah, but think about like a leg extension. There's no stretch shortening cycle. For that you just movement, have yeah. A very high, like a very rapid um, release of calcium. You have the very high activation because you get a really large descending signal to the muscle, right? All the things are there, whether you move or not. And I think that'd be a really interesting kind of place to explore that I don't think a lot of people have. Of. Kind of reminds me of the, the cross training or cross education type concept, you know, where like you just train unilaterally and you actually can see adaptations on the other, you know, side. I just think those things are so cool that to your point again, like the muscle's not even moving, not even contracting in that kick situation, but you still get that kind of neuromuscular crossover that seems to 
still be able to play a role in the unused limb. Yeah, we try. We try to use that a lot in rehab as like no excuse not to do anything. I mean, that's what I'm going to do stuff. That's all I've been doing in my garage gym since the accident. Can't use that the right arm, so I've just been hammering away on the left side, doing whatever I can think of for exercises. Um, but certainly with the the change in muscle size and kind of growth, yeah, I think uh, it goes to exactly two really important points I think you guys brought up. What can you do regularly? Like the, the as soon as you guys started talking, the first thing that popped in my head is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. What can you maintain to not let yourself skip out on a workout for all the reasons you brought up uh well i have to go to the gym and i wouldn't have that much time and yada 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 um and also another really good point is what do you enjoy um the best think, workout is the one you actually do <laughs> yeah yeah 100%. Part of the one that you can actually stick to i think going to that the only the only part of muscle confusion that i think is valid is if you get bored and if you, if it, the same type of stuff every day gets stale for you and it means you're not going to try and not have fun and put effort in. Yeah. Change it up every day. It doesn't matter. There's nothing yeah. special about it, but if that's what will make you enjoy it and kind of bust ass in the gym, do it. Well, I think, I think that's why it became so popular is because people craved that. Oh, I need something new and exciting to keep me motivated to do stuff. You know, they, just didn't like sitting down and hammer away at the same workout every week and get better at it. You know, so I to like, you know, Joel, you were saying with the P90X, like that's a, that's why that thing blew up so much is it were fun, exciting, you know, challenging workouts, something different every day. You never knew what you're going to get. Just like we were talking, you know, like if somebody's just starting out, like you can get a lot of strength changes by doing the same thing for quite a period of time. You know, if you just progress your reps up and then if those, you know, you tap out there, you start progressing a little bit of weight, like you can potentially go for quite a while. I almost wonder if that's, you know, again, muscles don't think, you know, muscle confusion, you know, whatever you take out of it is, you know, do you get almost like a dual effect with that is because you're changing things up? Like you just feel like, you can get those progressive things, but you're just getting that much better because you are doing different things. You're recovering a little bit from doing one style, you know, one day versus another one. Like, you know, I, I always bicep curl, you know, like if I'm doing a traditional bicep curl on Monday, but doing a hammer curl on Thursday. And then when I come back for the bicep curl the next Monday, like both of those increase over time. Cause yes, they're similar, but they're working slightly different muscles and how they're doing it. So that's why you're getting all these results by quote unquote muscle confusion when you're really just following some more like progressive overload. You just happen to be hitting more things. Not to well, say I that you that, have to do that. Well, I think that's, I mean, when you get down into more of the technical side of the muscle confusion concept, like again, if you're changing exercise types or grips or angle, like you're, you're going to be recruiting slightly different, you know, muscle fibers and, being used in different ways so you'll still expand kind of the i think adaptations that you could get because of that like there are alterations from one movement to the next even though they're targeting the same muscle group per se but there's going to be some you know slight differences every time and i think I mean, people also like that the soreness that they get you know from the novelty of a new exercise like oh must have really worked it yesterday you know i'm I'm sore i did something different yeah i think uh one other thing is um the volume aspect right like if you're doing i don't know i would keep using bicep curl but it is i guess an isolated movement that's easy to picture um but any other exercise like if you're still doing your bicep curls and then you keep changing up all of the uh accessory movements you're doing you're likely to be able to do more volume and that volume is going to push you to adapt more. Um, and another aspect that it's something I've, I've learned a lot about um, because it was huge for me is the psychological aspect. 
sometimes just seeing or doing a new exercise where maybe you haven't done in a while, there's an infinite number of exercises you can do and see a PR, right? And sometimes just that PR, and even if it's something trivial, like pull downs, I've never done 185, I've only done 170, and you do, you hit a PR on pull downs, like that can change the dynamic of your workout and make you try harder on other things, which then facilitates kind of augmented progress in other things, right? Yeah. I even I feel that, that way, just stepping in a new gym, you know, like, oh man, this is sweet. I've never tried this machine before. And just the excitement of being in a new atmosphere alone can sometimes just jumpstart a workout like that. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people let, leave that by the wayside. Kind of like, I think people have realized the placebo effect is still a valuable tool. Heck yeah. I think the psychology can't be left out because it, will build or destroy a workout or a competition or a training cycle um and so sometimes yeah just do something you haven't done in a while get a pr and let that kind of motivate you to continue in the gym that day Andy, you were talking about before we again when we um before we came on and recorded something with satellite cells and like muscle memory to a degree. And I, I'll let you explain it, but I just know I, I there's basically the concept of like, say you had really good training, life changes, things came up. If you're an athlete or just generally um, into working out or any type of competitor, you get injured, you know, and things slow down um, a little bit for you the ability to get that back when you've already reached a certain point versus, you know, continuing to try and excel on that point. Cause that's one I always talked with a lot of, especially when I worked with football of like, yeah, we're going to lose some, but you've already set a high bar. It's going to be easier for us to get back there than it was for you to get there because your body's already been there. So you, I get it. We're going to get there, but let's not, overly stress about it because it will get back yeah you, um, you said you just had seen some more interesting things coming out of that which i'd just be interested to hear more about 100 um well i guess preemption i'm not a molecular biologist um and nor do i um you're much closer the... than i am so i'll take it <laughs> but i play both... one on tv is that what you're getting yeah. at <laughs> infinitely far away um, but I can read a scientific paper and try to understand it. This, some of this work is way over my head, but from my understanding, which is all I can speak about, uh, yeah, there's work coming out and work that's been done for a while. I like this idea of like myogenic memory. And I think there's some data suggesting that that's facilitated through either satellite cell characteristics or satellite cell number um, whereby yeah if you train and your satellite cells adapt in some way like I said whether it's some uh, intrinsic characteristic or the the tool number the location whatever it is um, and if you stop training and detrain for a while it seems like there's some uh, pathway whereby if you start training again, you get to where you were, um, even relative, if you, if you went to near to where you started training, um, much faster than you would if you had just started training. So basically you get back to where you were uh, appreciably faster than how long it took you to get there. Um, and I think anyone who's trained and taking time off understands this just viscerally uh, I, I don't think it's just satellite cells, but um, you come back and you feel really bad about yourself for a little while. But after two, three weeks of kind of banging in the gym, you're close to where you were and you feel just as comfortable as you were. And it's such a good feeling to know that it can come back and come back that quickly. Like, because as it's going downhill, you just get pissed. You're like, God dang it, I worked so hard. 
to accrue a certain level of strength or size and then you just watch it go right down the toilet but you try to remind yourself and come back pretty quick body is surprisingly adaptable thanks didn't there's a paper i think Stu had a paper uh Stu phillips at mcmaster in cell um kind of discussing this idea it was a review i believe or a secondary analysis of some stuff um and i i could just be misremembering because i have just read i read way more papers in the past month than i have in a long time um that would be a good thing to pull up and maybe put in the show notes there's another one too that i used to teach off of in class of a really well done study it was a training study and then they they had like a detraining group and a complete cessation of training group and then evaluate like how low the the decreases in strength and size got and then they kind of restarted the programs and followed them up after four weeks i think they had three conditions actually one that kept going one that detrained like just cut things in half the other one that completely stopped and you know all three yeah it's... after that like four weeks you know actually but, still had oh, similar I, I got you i can hear you Now you're frozen. <laughs> Thankful for editing. Yeah, good point. I think Ischierdo was the author on the paper I'm thinking of. Yeah, if you get them, uh, send them along. If you if you remember it. Yep, I'll track it down. Now, now you're muted. muted. Yeah, I, I have no idea what's going on with my internet, but I pay way too much for this. <laughs> yeah, we feel that here too. Yeah, for both of those articles, um, if you guys could send them along, I'll link them up in show notes. Um, I know from own personal experience, it's been the way that I've steadily crept myself towards 300 pounds. I'll start lifting heavy, get in a good place, put on some muscle. Life will happen. I won't work out. Yet somehow my weight doesn't seem to drop with that. <laughs> and then I start up again and so all of a sudden I'm up 10 more pounds um, unintentionally. So uh, you got to be careful if you do detrain that you don't know, like how you handle some <laughs> of that stuff because that has been how I've cons grown considerably since I graduated college. Well, I think along that line, uh, I don't think this is the direction any of us were meaning to go, but I think it's important if life comes up to still try to do whatever you can. So it's the idea sure. of like, um, uh, like uh, exercise snacks, um, trying to do whatever you can. I, like I tell my mom, that's right. If you don't have the desire to go to the gym, just try to move more. So when you get home from work, stand up and sit down in your chair 10 times, wait 20 minutes and do it again. Uh, try to break up sedentary time by going for a walk, even five, 10 minute walk, get up and stretch, whatever. Uh, more is better. And there is an upper limit that I don't think anyone in their right mind, there are people who go above that upper limit, but most all regular people probably are not even close to approaching of the volume that you'd have to worry about. Yeah. And I think if, yeah, just walk. Going for a walk for 10 minutes when I think, especially in professions like academia and research and being in a clinic, maybe athletic training might be a little bit different because you're up and doing exams and kind of treating and whatever. But certainly in academia, we get stuck at desks behind computers quite a bit. And if you can do the standing desk, great. Uh, if you can't, uh, then just get up and go for a walk. Go grab a water. Go to the whatever. Five, ten minutes. Try to break up the sedentary time. I think there are enough data, and it, they're very convincing. Even Stu had that study where they yeah. had people uh, just stand up and sit down. And they, they found greater uh, cumulative muscle protein synthesis over the course of a day. Um, I think breaking up sedentary time, and not even, I find uh, instead of 
when I get that urge at like one o'clock or noon to grab a coffee, a lot of times I just go for a 15 minute walk and it's way more effective than just pounding more caffeine that ultimately just makes me feel worse. Yeah, I've even done that exercise snack concept with like strength workouts, usually on like lighter load days. Because the thing I like about that is that I I skip warm ups like very rarely. Will I go through a twenty minute you know warm up unless I'm working up to like heavy singles or doubles? You know, you kind of progress your way up to it. But like I'll literally there's mornings like Joel's saying like oh I'm gonna get a workout in before the kids get up. You're like three lifts in and all of a sudden kids are up it's like well i only got a third of the way through my workout for the day but then all like after we get ready we're, we got 15 minutes before the bus comes i'll do two more yeah, exercises yeah. and then at night like same thing like we got a little time while dinner's getting made i'll go do the last two lifts of the day and throughout the day i got my workout in but it certainly took multiple attempts um and again, like without having to do warm ups and stuff like that, because the loads were lighter, it, you're able to do that. And I think it's just a better way instead of, oh, I don't have time to go to the gym for an hour and 20 minutes today. Like if you have that mentality, I, I'd rarely get the, the amount of workouts in that I, I want to. And then I'm also spoiled by having a garage gym. Like obviously yeah. that's not very feasible for everyone if they have to physically go to a gym to get stuff in. But I mean, I do have a cyclist too, or not a cyclist, uh, concept two in my living room. <laughs> nice. Oh, there you uh, go. We, we started telling the kids, like, we got a, a treadmill and a, a bike out in the garage. Like, if they want to watch more TV than we're, you know, comfortable letting them do or something, we'll say, all right, you can keep watching, but you got to go out and walk on the treadmill while you watch your show or whatever. So <laughs> we're trying to dangle that carrot in front of them. I think it would be a really interesting thing. Um, you met Max at ACSM. Uh, Joel, you haven't. Yep. Uh, in our lab, we have, I still think he's nuts, but um, he was director of sport nutrition for Notre Dame Athletics uh, okay. and then started. So he's RD, CSSD, um, just decided to change it up and get a PhD. <laughs> um, but he is... Uh, I don't want to say nice things about him if he ever sees this. <laughs> he is probably one the person that epitomizes this idea so much. Um, half the time you can't find the guy because he's just pacing around in, in our big gym space in Freer and answering emails on his phone or he's walking on the trail now typing uh, and reading or whatever. Um, he can't sit still. Uh, and I mean, it shows super fit dude, um, jacked, um, I mean, pretty ugly, but um, <laughs> he would be an interesting, especially because the RDCSSD has the athletics background and kind of the transition. I think he would be an interesting guest to have on here. Uh, yeah. About this, this and a range of topics, obviously. Not to totally veer off our point, but uh, that was kind of one of the styles we were thinking about doing with this. As we set this time, we just invite people to join, give them the basic premise, um, and just have a few more guests instead of just a couple of people yakking at each other. So uh, hopefully, hopefully, you know, if we get a streak going again, don't call it a comeback, but uh, <laughs> we can we can see if we can get that actually going. Well, he owes me an interview anyway because he volunteered to write an article for uh cpfda is that the organization yep. Um, yep and forced me to do a written interview so i'll a, chat with him a, and see if he's willing to come on that's a conference i'd really like to get to i've heard those are good events it's just he always every year it's always like two weeks before acs sound that's why i've never done it because it's I don't think I could swing both those trips almost back to back, but she could have last year. year. Where's that one at? Chicago. Oh yeah. See, I was gonna say that the reason why I should have gone to CPSDA last year is because it was in Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Yeah, it was right up the road. Yeah. Kinsley was talking at it. But yeah, uh not to veer in personal Ooh. conversation on a podcast that 
uh, not to brag, but we had 130 new listeners on. Um, I think that was a big deal. That's a big one. I think, yeah, I, it's this prevailing idea with both exercise, nutrition, everything, right? Change is hard, and doing things that uh, are beneficial typically aren't that fun unless you're maniacs like probably most of our friends who really enjoy uh, beating the hell out of themselves in the gym. I think incremental uh, progress is still progress. And I think people underestimate like exactly going back all the way to one of the, I forget which one you said, one day a week, huge. It's infinitely better than zero days a week. And you can maintain a lot with one day a week. You, you may not yeah, be I mean, you can get gains, but you yeah, it may not be as much can. as you want, but you can definitely hold on to where you're at. And I think oh. this is good timing for this because AHA just finally has come out and said resistance exercise is good for the cardiovascular system. Yeah, you just that's, that's, faster, that's, right? that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Cardio? Yeah. You mean lifting the weights faster? I think that would be... God, I might have to send you two papers, I think. Uh, I know. Did AJ, did you read Stu's commentary on uh, the age of resistance exercise for um, health? Is that the one that has, like, dosing recommendations in it? Um... Uh, it was in. It's a big journal, wasn't it? Let me pull it up. I think one of our former Lindenwood students was on that. I think I know which one you're talking about. If you didn't publish so much, dang it, dude. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, he's got to have an H index off the charts. Oh, well, on this, what does it say here? Oh, yeah, like 135. Based on Google Scholar. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pull it up. I'm not going to waste time here, but um, I think previously everyone would basically had the idea that resistance exercise was bad for cardiovascular health. Um, and I think it got a bad rap. But certainly, I think it's if it's good for cardiovascular health, that's great. Even if it's not, I think it's good for functional capacity and then functional independence, which means you're not frail, which is the biggest predictor of all-cause mortality. Um, the ability to take care of yourself is huge, both physically and psychologically. Lift weights and drink whiskey. This is mean, a good time for a shameless plug for our new... Uh... CP clothing store that we just opened up officially today uh, with one of our first shirts having the quote, I work out because I enjoy pizza and beer on it. <laughs> um, just telling it how it is. So uh, by the time this is out and you're listening to this, head over to clinicallypress.org backslash shop for a link to that. Um, more uh, shirts coming in the future. We're just getting a few of them. Uh, the other one, Andy, I would guess you'd probably agree with is, you know, it, it says squatting isn't bad for your knees. So, yeah, it's great for your knees. So, check those out if we get anything resembling 139 <laughs> listeners to this episode. I wonder where that concept did originate from, though, Andy, of lifting being bad for, you know, like endurance or cardiovascular health. I think, it, I think it like there's a specific certainly, hypertrophy of the heart. Like, yeah, I think it's, I mean, there's certainly some evidence indicating that concentric hypertrophy, uh, like concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, probably not the best thing in the world. Um, I, I think the evidence is strong enough to say that it's bad. Um, and that, so this is the idea that your heart has to pump harder because the systemic blood pressure is so high that in order to eject blood into the aorta and systemic circulation, it has to contract harder. Um, whereas eccentric um, left ventricular hypertrophy is probably very good, which is 
you're running. So you have a lot more um, uh, venous return and a lot more filling of the left ventricle and that stretching causes hypertrophy. Um, I think the basis is probably good, um, but I mean, there are goods and bads to even for muscular health, resistance exercise, right? Like, um, so I think it's more about not picking the individual characteristics that change, but looking at a holistic uh, adaptation or a holistic ad adaptive response. I was going to say, imagine, you, you know, if you just get outside of the heart, like you're going to see a ton of improvements in vascular function, vascular health. You know, you're going to see the metabolic improvements. You're going to see improvements in VO2 max. Like if you want to stay within the endurance side of it. And so, like, there are a lot of other positives that often get overlooked in that kind of topic. But I, I guess, yeah, if you're just focusing on the heart, I could see that kind of. Well, I also think a lot of, I think a lot of people think about cardiovascular health and kind of muscle health within the paradigm of an athlete. And I think that's a flawed idea um, that I, I understand why I typically think of it that way. Cause I come from an applied sp sports science background and I've been an athlete most of my life. Um, but I think when you really hone in on like the general population and just a recreationally active person who's lifting weights and running to try to be healthy, I think there's very little, you could say that resistance exercise is negative. Um, I think it's contribution. Yeah. Everyone thinks about the the physical side, right? The strength power paradigm, being able to be functionally independent, but uh, its contribution to regulation of whole body metabolism can't be understated. It's a central site for glucose disposal. Um, it's important for fatty acid disposal and regulation. Uh, the only reservoir, not the only, liver two, the primary reservoir of amino acids. Um, and, and see, that's where I think it's better than endurance exercise in that regard, like with all those types of benefits. Yeah. I think we should be careful about um, cautioning. I think we, we can be realistic. But the translational side, I think uh, we should be careful about bringing up the dangers of something that is inherently good. Um, I think education is one thing, but uh, scaring people into not exercising who don't have a background in physiology and health and biomedical stuff, I think is a, a dangerous game. Yeah. And, and like you said earlier in the episode, very few people are even coming close to that going overboard the threshold idea, you know, whether it's too heavy or too much volume and even doing cardio stuff, like in terms of too many miles throughout the week, like very few people come close to that. Even if you're whoop straps as you're overstrained or whatever, you know, like a lot of people don't even come close to half of what would probably actually be needed to be overtrained or, going over that threshold just move agreed find what works get after it make it consistent and then look yep. at small changes that can have a big impact don't make it more complicated than it needs to be ah uh, isn't that the truth complicated and simple right be realistic a lot of people are good at finding excuses and reasons why they can't work out consistently rather than finding excuses to work out consistently. Yep. And we get it that there's a lot out there to consume. And that's kind of also part of this is, you know, you can just find something, go for it, start slow, get there. Yep. Jumping into a full P90X or insanity right away might just be that might be a little insanity. But you can work your way up there if that's truly what you want to do. Or, as Andy was saying, you can go for a walk. Work on picking up the pace. Find a route you like and then just try and walk it a little faster the next time. And then a little faster and then a little longer. Just keep on going. 
Yep. Yeah, I think that's huge. This is the first year I got my average daily step count for the entire year above okay. thirteen above thirteen thousand steps a day. Darn. Yep. Isn't that I mean, I, I think it's so crazy <laughs> Americans and I'm a fat guy, so I I mean I'm guilty of it. Um and I'm a fat PhD student candidate. <laughs> um so I'm behind a desk a lot, but I think the idea that people regularly get in America like less than 5,000 steps comparatively to uh, developed European countries and uh, particularly a lot of the Scandinavian countries. Just getting 10,000 steps a day is probably, if I had to give one piece of health advice that was specific and measurable, it would it would mitigate a huge number of deaths in, the, yep. in this country. And and it's embarrassing how hard it is sometimes to get there. It's even <laughs> like when you look of, at a... Uh, it's almost in the winter. Yes. The summer it's, when or the nicer months when the kids are out and want to go for a bike ride and you just go for a random walk because of that. Yeah, and then yeah. the winter where it's just hard to get outside. Yeah, sometimes those steps are harder, but I get you. One of the hardest, or not hardest, uh, one of the most ridiculous realizations I had uh, when I first started reading kind of uh, endurance type training uh, research is that I don't have to know where the IRB was that approved the study. I can just look if they're recreationally active and like general pop people. I can just look at the descriptive characteristics for VO2 max and know if it was done in the US or done somewhere else. <laughs> because yeah. in other countries, it's not abnormal to have a 45 average, whereas yeah. in the US, that's not going to happen for the vast majority of studies. 45, 50, even, yeah. depending whatever methodology you use to uh, measure VO2 units. But I remember, I remember reading in class, you know, like some people's graded exercise time duration, like they, you know, as long as they got in the test before they had to stop and reading, you know, some people only went like four minutes. I was like, what the hell? Four minutes? Like, come on. And then I tested some people in our clinical weight loss trials that same thing. They wouldn't even get out of like the warm up or stage one. And they're giving me the cut signal. I'm just like, whoa. And their VO2 max was seven or nine, you know, and that's, that's relative. That's not absolute. Yeah. VO2. That's, that's nine mils per kg per minute. Just like, woof. That is deconditioned. Move more. Yep. Well, uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to be the one to call it. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I was going to say, I feel like this is a good first step back. And like we said, we're going to try and make this a streak. We'll try and do it on a day where we're all a little more lively instead of a Friday evening when everybody's pretty much ready to pack it in. But uh, we wanted to do it. It was a good reason to start after Andy finished up comps and um, all of those exams to get on to dissertation. But I'm looking forward to this. I'm excited to get going again. Yeah, me too. Yep. I, yeah, I think reconnecting with you guys is going to be really good. And I think things are about to change for me. So you guys get to watch progress. Yep. And we'll get some more guests on. We've got a few, you know, probably get Doc on, I get Kyle on, I get a few others. So, um, yeah. shit, I admit. Maybe over the holidays we'll we'll do something if Andy gets back up here and we can all figure out a way to connect again. So Yeah, hundred percent. Let's just do again like a live stream with all these driving so we can get eight and a half hour episode in. There you go. Just they don't make I the mean, time fly. <laughs> I call a million people anyway, so there you go. Good way to get things done. Well, yep. fellas, enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll get this out because i was able to at least sort of get back into the spotify at least know what email it is so we can get it posted again yeah. so we'll go from there um and offline we'll talk about it at some point we maybe have to do some apparel we found a pretty slick way to do that so we'll figure that out but um until next time we'll talk to you guys later Adios. Adios.